Now, I am joined, brace yourself, everybody, uh, by uh, Douglas Murray, who is a Sun columnist, apparently. That's perhaps the best, depending on what you read, but maybe the least of who he is. He is the international best-selling writer of Madness of Crowds. He has had billions, and I do mean billions, of hits. People watch him, not for five or ten minutes, but for hours listening to what he has to say um, on YouTube. They come to his lectures, they listen to him. He's something of an international guru. And I have to confess, he is also a friend of mine. And even when, which is more than from time to time, I might not agree with what he says, I have to say that you can't help but sit back sometimes in bewildered awe at admiring how he said it. It's why he's become a star here and an international star around the world. And America, they can't get him off the television and he's really come here. I don't even know why. We can't even pay him. He's been doing me a favour. It's a delight uh, to see you. It's a great uh, pleasure Douglas. to see you. And we agreed four hours, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, I'll pay you uh, mm. in a drink. Now, just before you arrived, we were talking about Ollie Robinson, mm. uh, a, a cricketer who you will uh, know more about than me, knowing about cricket and living in that green bit outside London called the countryside. <laughs> um <laughs> that they've unearthed these tweets mm. that he posted when he was a young man and now he is subject to this new phenomena mm. of cancellation. Mm. Right? Wrong? Where are we? I wrote about it in The Sun yesterday because it, 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 it really troubles me, this case. I think it will trouble a lot of the people joining us um, for lots of reasons. One is um, this young player, Ollie Robinson, this happened on what should have been the proudest day of his career. He just played for his national team, the England team, for the first time in a test match. And that day, it should have been his proudest day, instead was his most humiliating. Uh, he was on television, uh, read out a, frankly, to my mind, slightly North Korean style apology. You know, had to read out all of the things that he said he'd done wrong and apologised and promised that he was with the, the whole thing now and, and this was a mistake of his youth. So there was that. There was a sort of cruelty of the timing of it. Another thing is just simply that we do have to wonder in our society what kind of a society we want to be and whether whether we want to be this sort of retributive society which goes over something somebody said 10 years ago on Twitter, bantering with their mates, basically, and then tears up their career because of it. I don't want to be in that society. I think it's an ugly, ugly type of society. And here's the thing that, that as I said in The Sun yesterday, that I, I care about most in this is there is no point having a system of complete and total retribution against people for making one mistake once in their teenage years, if you haven't also wondered how they can come back from it. And the cruelty about the treatment of Ollie Robinson isn't just what happened in the day, but that after making his apology, the ECB suspended him. Mm -hmm. And that looks to me just like a vengeful, nasty uh, sort of world. And, and I don't think we want to have that. There were some people out here listening you know, might ask themselves a question, is there a thing that said even 10 years ago, which wasn't acceptable in any polite conversation, is there a line that's crossed where you've become irredeemable or is forgiveness always possible? Well, I mean, it very much depends on the circumstances. My own view is that actual forgiveness has to involve the person who has done something wrong being forgiven by the person who has been wronged. Right. It's an absolutely central thing in this. I mean, I've seen it. I saw it once in the States. Uh, there was a terrible, there was a, there was a, sh a shooting by a, a, an unbelievably rare but a white supremacist in the south of the country uh, at a black church. And the families of the people who had been killed came out the next day and said they forgave the killer. I mean, that is a jaw-dropping thing to witness. So real forgiveness is one of the unfathomable abilities of mankind and one of the most admirable. But what we're dealing with in our age and this in this country at the moment isn't that. It's people saying, look at this thing this person said that I think somebody could find offensive. A lot of it is banter. A lot of it is, it's been reported, by the way, the Olive Robinson case is fascinating because, as always in this, very few people actually look at what has been said. So they say racist and misogynistic tweets. A lot of it is, uh, the, the misogynistic allegation is about stuff that, frankly, you know, look, teenage boys joke about girls. Teenage girls joke about boys. Is all of it nice? No. Would you want any of it put in front of the public 10 years later? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. The worry I have, Douglas, is that um, I have to be clear, you know, I do 
do my work and prep my briefs before um, talking about anything. But I was very concerned to hear that I hadn't been aware, in fact, that one of the tweets included the N word, which mm -hmm. wasn't acceptable ten sure. years ago. And that really goes to the heart mm. of the question that I'm asking you. Yeah, yeah. Is there something? Is there an expression which is so beyond the pale, even then, that that mm. should be a subject of enduring shame. Well, um, he, he, here's an oddity of that, though. I, I saw that tweet. Uh, uh, my understanding of that is it, he's not using it, saying that, using that word mm -hmm. as a derogatory term against a particular black person or against black people in general. He seems to be using the term, it, this, the, 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 the current standing on that word is any use of it by anyone who isn't black must be an act of racism. And you could take that view. But there have, for instance, been recently people in America fired from their jobs for citing that word as an example of a word you wouldn't use. Mm -hmm. So there is a weird um, danger around mm -hmm. it. Should a 17 year old 10 years ago have known that? I think so, yes. Um, does it mean that he's a racist? No, not necessarily. Mm -hmm. uh, Isn't it, though, some people would argue, and we'll come back up to the BAM community, in this instance, um, people of colour, to make a determination whether they forgive him. Just before we go to the news, one of the examples I think of is Prince Harry, and how offended I was when he was a young man with a Nazi motif going to a fancy dress conference. Mm. Now I thought, how stupid, of course. Mm. I understood, but it was deeply offensive. What did he do? He had the opportunity to meet the then now past sadly chief mm. rabbi. He learnt from it and the community forgave him. And he seems to have been forgiven because he seems to represent a different political point of view, for example. Something mm. for us to think about, and I certainly agree with you that none of us want to live in any society of any value where forgiveness isn't a possibility. We're with Doug Murray, now he's agreed to come and speak with you. You don't have to sit at home along with the other billions on YouTube because you can hear him today on talk radio. Uh, but I am pleased, thrilled and above averagely delighted that I've got Douglas Murray here, international superstar writer, sold billions of books, well, millions, and is a YouTube sensation, a sensation across the world for his, um, well, uncompromising activism and his fearlessness in the face of, I have to say, attacks on him from the left, who have largely, some may argue, um, unanswered a lot of the claims that he makes in his book, The Madness of Crowds, which is worth reading. Now, one of the things we agree on, I think, Douglas, is our position on free speech. Mm. And I'm going to start by telling you a very quick story, which is about my, my grandfather. Um, as you will be aware, he was a Holocaust survivor, and I remember going with him to Speaker's Corner, this is a man who had lived in an age through a moment, through the darkness of having quite literally touched the face of tyranny and knew mm. in every sense what it meant to live under the asphyxiation of a state with no freedom. And we would listen to the worst anti-Semitic bile. And I'll never forget it. He'd say to me, oh, you see, Hesse spoke like that. He said, in this country, this man can say whatever he wants. And despite my strong views and my proudness of being a member of the LGBTQ community and uh, certainly a proud uh, Jewish person. I'm a free speech fundamentalist. Mm. You know, I think it stops at mm. shouting fire uh, in a cinema. Mm. Uh, you wrote um, an excellent article um, in the Telegraph on Cambridge University, but more broadly, your activism mm. and writing about this, I think has been something which all of us should read and consider. Can, can you just talk about them and help us with that? Sure. I mean, I'm pretty much a free speech absolutist. I disagree with you on uh, two things. Ever. I mean, I, I, I haven't, uh, you could call me a member of the LGBT community, but I'd be quite annoyed if you did. I loathe that stuff. I, really I loathe it. I'm not a member of the community. What is it? Who's the group head? You know, who's our leader? Me. Oh, well, well, if that was the case, I'd be happier, happier to, <laughs> to say, oh, I'm a member of the Rinder community. Uh, I don't I don't I don't want some uh, big gay panjandrum claiming to speak for me uh, from Stonewall or any of these things. I loathe these groups. Mm -hmm. I think they're pompous and past their sell by date. Mm. Well um, decorated, so that, though. Um, uh, we'll, we'll skip that. So there's two things I disagree. The first is that the second, by the way, I disagree mm -hmm. with the, the limit of um, the limit of free speech of shouting fire in a crowded theatre. As I often point out, right. if there is a fire in a theatre, it's your duty to shout fire. Mm -hmm. And very often, that is actually the most important duty: is to say the thing that you have to say, um, which needs to be said. And uh, my own fear for free speech in our own society is that what is happening is that a sort of 
um, a war against it is being waged by dull bureaucrats who would like to twiddle with our heads and our minds and even our facial muscles. I'm referring here to the Vice Chancellor of Cambridge University, who, as I wrote about last month, uh, recently issued guidance that you could, if you were at Cambridge University, you could anonymously inform, anonymously inform, on a fellow student or a professor if they did a range of things, including so-called microaggressions. And a microaggression, for people who don't know, are lucky enough not to know, right. is an aggression so tiny that it might be entirely invented by you. <laughs> um, so it, it allowed people to inform on people anonymously if there was a microaggression going on, going on. And one example of a microaggression alleged was if any person raised an eyebrow whilst any member of a minority was speaking. Now, I'm not having this rubbish. And I don't think, I think it's beneath our contempt and certainly beneath the contempt of very brilliant academic thinkers at one of our foremost universities to be told how to behave, to be told when they can raise an eyebrow or move a facial muscle. And this is what we're dealing with. The particular person who was, uh, who was um, trying to make that happen is an incredibly undistinguished Canadian lawyer called Stephen Toop, who unfortunately is the vice chancellor of Cambridge at the moment. But people like this have gone through our public life in the UK. These well, dull little accomplished people who insist that they know the words that all of us should say, the sentiments we should express, and when we're allowed to move our facial muscles. I think we need to stop. I think we need to ask these people, who the hell do you think you are? But who's this driven by? And this is a, a difficult question because, um, you know, you speak, listen and hear to people, and I may not agree, but I have the, let's use language, that might not agree on, but I think this is a real use of the term privilege. And part of the privilege I've had over the years is to speak to people beyond the borders of London, people that have lived experiences outside of this city, where there's rich cultural life. I'm going to use, for example, all of the places that went blue recently, Hartlepool, mm -hmm. etc. And what I know is that they have real commonality. I answer legal questions for them mm. uh, most days. Um, have real commonality with, 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 for example, the communities of, of colour mm. uh, in the Bangladeshi community in South London, for example. And the issues that they really care about have nothing to do with this stuff. Mm. It's about housing. Mm. Um, it's about access to yeah. power, good schools for their kid. They share this stuff and they have no access to power whatsoever, but they are being driven apart by this mm. stuff. Yeah. So my question is... Is it really uh, communities of colour, let's call them that, for, for the purpose of this discussion, who are driving this discussion? No, no. So who's behind it's it? All, it's, all, it's all driven by uh, guilt-ridden, um, banal figures who tend to be white, um, who believe that this is the game to play to win in this era. And they may not be wrong in one way. They're quite, they're quite clever. These are people who just want power. In a previous age, they'd have switched to becoming Protestants when the king was a Protestant king, and they would have switched to being Catholics when the king was a Catholic king. Mm -hmm. uh, they have decided that in the current era, you have to do a lot of stuff. By the way, you just did it again earlier. You said lived experience. What other type of experience is there? Um, Corrected by Douglas Murray. So, you have to do all that thing. You have to talk about lived experience. You have to talk about communities. You have to talk about pride in communities and all of this. You have to talk about intersectionalism. You have to talk about privilege. And I'm not up for that game. And I don't think other people should be either. I think that we should address real issues where mm -hmm. they exist. And they do exist in this country. We have so many problems facing us in this country. We have, we've just gone through the pandemic with millions of people's jobs at risk, with people on furlough, with people locked in their houses, and we see major figures of proud institutions in this country mm -hmm. playing these silly and divisive games. I want to get these people out of the way, well, out of our collective way. I like the word lived experience because I think it goes to power. Now, we may disagree about this, but I'm going to repeat this. The reason I worry about this debate, and I'm going to ask you about where it emerges from, because I have my suspicions, mm. and I suspect you're very articulate about this, and I know that you've thought about it deeply and really thought about it. But the lived experiences of people in Bolsover, tribally Labour, mm. now conservative, so conservative, Sedgefield, Tony Blair's constituency, for mm. heaven's sake, Hartley Paul, are similar to the day-to-day -day lived experience, whatever you want to call it, of people that don't have power. And very often those are people of colour. And I'm going to repeat, those communities are driven apart by this argument when mm. they should be 
working on collaboratively all of the issues that prevent them from making meaningful change and having access to social mobility. Now, I'm going to part that for a second because one of the suspicions that I have is this, mm. that this argument very often is taking place on social media. Yes, and people have, which is a, which is a, but, but mean, let me ask a you zoo this. of maniacs. Well, it might yeah. be a zoo of maniacs, but what it has is a disproportionate power to influence, shape, and curate the national conversation, mm. the policy of major political parties, and, of course, the um, cultural conversation as well. Yes. And the reason for that is, I see it, I know politicians, they're on Twitter too. Yeah, yeah. They are addicted. They're spans, me... They get their little hearts, yeah, yeah. they get the little endorphin rush. They are shaping policy yeah. based on what um, Cat28 says, Let who's me... otherwise somebody who sits up all night wearing a muumuu and chain-smoking parliaments. Why mm. should they be influencing the political mm. debate when we know that people outside of the social media bubble, going to repeat again, Hartlepool Sedgefield, um, uh, all of those constituencies and my lived experience, going to rely on that community in South London, aren't on social media. They're worried about real life things. Okay, there's, uh, well, let me first of all say there is a reason for this, and, I'm gonna, and I'll, I'll, I'll state it as bluntly as possible because it's very, very troubling, and we should spend more time on it. Um, the we, uh, but before I do, I should say this, we are living in an age of extraordinary distraction. And one of the consequences of that is that we have what I call the chihuahua effect. The chihuahua is the small yappy dog that can get everybody's attention. A, a yappy chihuahua on social media can get a major politician having to respond to their point within the day. And that is a very big problem for our society. Now, here's the follow on from that. The problem is that people who have power, re actual power, find it more comfortable to deal with some of those issues sometimes because the real issues coming down the road at us are so much harder. Let me give an example. What's probably the major issue now facing our society? It's, I would submit, the fact that young people find it almost impossible to accumulate capital. And it is unclear to me that you will have capitalists in the next generation when you don't love capitalism because it's in the blood. You would love it when you realize that it works for you and works better than any damn system other than it that's come around. But what happens at the moment is that we have a generation coming up who are expected to love capitalism but cannot accumulate capital, may come into some money if their parents had a property that they were lucky enough to buy in a sensible um, house rising area they might come into property this next generation mm -hmm. they might come into some money in their 50s or 60s when they don't really need it they need it when they're younger and they can't accumulate it that's a very very big issue so, to so raise you would say the people and what that we ha have instead uh -huh. is the demented chihuahua debate and I'd like to get us off that if possible but there are lots of reasons why we won't. So there's low property only democracy. The vision, if you like, for example, certainly Thatcher's uh, vision that made people feel inclusive, have a stake, for example, in their democracy yeah. um, without having property in the first place. And what you're talking about more than ever is this conversation, which I agree with you, this difference between the haves and the have nots and this celebristocracy who are talking about narrow issues that are triaging, that's a posh way of saying giving priority to things that don't affect, sorry Douglas, the lived experiences of those with no access to power. Well, as ever Douglas puts it incredibly compellingly and you can read that in The Madness of Crowds as well. Douglas Murray, uh, Sun columnist, um, international social commentator, best-selling author, nemesis of the left, nemesis of, well, woolly thinkers across the globe and um, here's today he's here today and Douglas we are privileged it is my lived experience to have oh. you here um, I can see there's you shrugging your shoulders there's some woolly thinking right there <laughs> rolling an eyebrow which I consider to be a microaggression but nevertheless <laughs> I'll take it um, because it's it's you um, one of the stories we dealt with earlier was them pulling down a portrait of the Queen in mm. one of the common rooms mm. I think at Magdalen College my own, my own was college. Your old college yeah you and Oscar Wilde you know they've yeah. got a lot to be thankful or to answer for. Um, <laughs> what do you think about this? Apparently, it was to be more I inclusive. Yeah, I, 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 don't, I'm, I think this is. As we were saying before, I think it's a slight distraction story. And the students always do stupid things. I mean, it's one of the things you do as your student. You hopefully grow up. You make some mistakes, and um, that that that's why I'm not particularly wild about politicians sort of leaping in on this debate. However, it is telling in one way, which is the presumption that. Uh, um, if you have an international cohort of students, 
you've got to sort of erase the Britishness somehow. Mm-hmm. I've written about this a lot, not least in The Strange Death of Europe. I think that it's, it's a great mistake in general. I think that people most like to adapt into a country and to be in a country which is recognisably that country. When I go into another country, I don't want it to adapt to me. I don't want them to take down their monarchs or their political leaders. I don't want them to not fly their flags because I'm there. I think that it's an incredibly pretentious and self-absorbed thing to presume that because you've gone to another country, that country should tear down all its emblems to suit you. That's not how this country should work. I don't think it's how most foreign students would want this country to work. Mm -hmm. I think it's almost certainly, once again, one of those things done by um, overprivileged and pretentious white students who don't know how lucky they are. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, I I would put this down, chalk this down to one of the stupid things they'll do in their lives. And I would hope that they'll grow up and uh, do less stupid things when they when they are uh, graduated from uh, and you presumably also college. hope there'll be some forgiveness, which is in, yes. in short supply. But I mean, but but this idea that that the Queen is co- you know con- uh, uh, connected with colonialism. I mean, everything's collect- connected with everything at some level. I mean, Magdalen College is co- connected with colonialism at some stage. Uh, when Magdalen College was founded in fifteenth uh, century, I'm sure that there were people in the foundation who were not on board with gay marriage and mass immigration and 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 all sorts of things. I bet. Oh, you know, I. I Women's rights weren't completely great until only about 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. So we could play this game endlessly. We could pull down absolutely every monument and, and, and building in this country. But I would suggest that that's a bad idea. And so whenever I see these sort of rampaging morons, I just say, we should make them stop. Well... Douglas Murray has said make that make you stop. Now, I, I just want to do something very, very quickly before we come to um, the next show this afternoon, which is going to be fantastic because I've got you here and everybody knows you as very serious. But of course, you know, you, that's just one of the delightful buffet of Douglas Murray, one of the <laughs> gorgeous threads that weaves itself into the tapestry because you can also be very funny as well. And actually, I think one of the reasons people respond to your writing across the world so well is because um, it, it, you often are funny. I especially have to say um, anybody that gets the chance to listen to the audiobook of madness of crowds what is it the rap that you don't don't you read the words <laughs> would you yes. read the words to what which, which is I, the I, I you know, quote uh, the work of um n minaj um, uh, Minaj, yes, we, we, we won't say what it is at this time of day no. but it's definitely worth a listen to uh, douglas reading in his uh, inimitably beautiful British voice, uh, the words to that. I, rap. Now, I met somebody who had that as the ringtone on their phone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, um, a, a man, Douglas, has uh, sparked a debate because um, it's about how often, um, well, men, everybody should change their underwear. Now, I'm reading uh, this. Um, the man from the US, he took to Twitter where he dropped the bombshell that he wears his underwear, get this people, 10 times before putting them in the wash. And uh, I mean, who goes and does that on Twitter? I mean, but mm. he does. And he penned this. He said, uh, let's be honest. No man wears a pair of underwear just one time before washing them. Every man wears each pair of underwear at least three to ten times before washing them. Let's keep it a buck. Now, he, he hasn't given his name. And I, you know, one doesn't want to. Is it called Dox people and find mm. out where they live? I'm going to say this again. I said it before. Um one day is appropriate. Nobody wants to clean up your your skid marks. And if you're not cleaning them up yourself, then it's either an act of, sorry, lived experience, feminist violence against your probably wife who's cleaning up the poo on your knickers or whatever you call them nowadays, or worse still, um, a poorer person who's cleaning up the poo on your pants. So what are you doing, men? Be clean. Now, um, I've said that. That's my reply out here. I'm not going to go to Twitter and respond to whoever this person is now with five followers and perhaps a cat. But um, I'm going to ask this of you, Douglas, because it's a gift of an opportunity. (laughs) You know, you're always being serious and people don't get to see this side of you. Do you have any bad habits? The person you were just referring to, I I referred earlier in the interview to uh, the discussion to the Chihuahua effect on social media, I think would agree that this man you were just referring to is is certainly a dirty Um, (laughs) uh, But I don't think I have any bad habits particularly. I'm relatively hygienic. I think that's an important thing to try to be or aspire to be. Um, uh, I'm probably irritable. That's uh, I have been known to be irritable. Um, even with people very close to me. Um, 
uh, that's that's a possibly bad trait. I uh, apart from that, no, I don't. I, I don't. I don't think. I think if you ask anyone close to me, mm -hmm. uh, uh, they could probably give you a longer list than I can give myself. I don't know. I would think. Um... You're normally quite charming. I mean, you, you sort of describe yourself as a, a British Mary Poppins, sort of practically perfect in every I way. I mean, I'm I not going describe to, myself I mean, I'm not as a going British to do Mary a, Poppins. A, a Kathy Newman say, so what you're saying really is you're practically perfect. But uh, uh, I'm not practically perfect. I, I have an awful lot of flaws um, and I'm riven with um, irritations. Um, but I'm very glad I am myself. Um, certainly I'm more irritable than Mary Poppins. <laughs> do you think? Oh, yeah. No and what do you do with that irritation? Because one of the things I, I worry about uh, with you is that, um, you know, I, I wonder how, and we don't have a great deal of time for this before we break, but um, do, you, do, you, or do you remain hopeful? Oh, yeah. Why? How? Oh, I'm endlessly hopeful. Well, because you just need to go out into a city like this and see all the opportunity. I mean, it's an amazing thing. We're just sitting here overlooking London. It's one of the world's great cities. We've been through a terrible year. But look around you. I mean, we're coming back. We're always going to come back. That's the thing with human beings. You know, there's a, a, a talk of C.S. Lewis I've quoted a lot during lockdown. You know, we, we do extraordinary things, human beings. You know, we play symphonies in beleaguered cities. We quote poetry on the, wall, the way to the walls of Quebec. We, we work out mathematical f theorems in prisons. We do extraordinary things. That's why I don't want us to get caught in all this rubbish that our age tells us to get caught on but to, but to start living and do what you're meant to be doing now not to wait for the optimal situation because the optimal situation will never come along but if this isn't pretty near optimal what is and on that joyous note of hope of the possibility of mankind and the fact we should all be thinking about how we can be happier better citizens better towards each other against a backdrop of forgiveness and actually hearing one another